I, I want to um, yeah. repair an unpardonable omission on my part, yeah. which is that I didn't introduce members of our task force who are here. Yes, that's a good idea. I mean, um, and, and Richard Bronk from the London School of Economics, Harjun Chang from the University of Cambridge, John Kay from the Financial Times, um, and Felix Martin from Thames Capital, River Capital. And uh, I, I think um, um, we've got uh, 12, 12 minutes, and I think um, we should maybe, I, I, I'd like to ask them, and maybe you'd like to, uh, do you have any comments to make on, on anything to add to what's been said? Or, or? Well, could I introduce the US? Yeah, of course. Yes. So the, the US committee is actually all here, too. Um, and uh, they are uh, Barbara Craig, Brad DeLong, uh, Kevin Hoover, Joyce Jacobson, uh, and Steve Ziliak, and I see some of you in the front row there. So um, please, hi. Um, so uh, please have at us. Let's let's uh, let's have a little discussion. But of course, we're going to be around all weekend. So uh, you 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 can buttonhole us at any other 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 moment as well. I guess we have to call on people ourselves. We don't have a moderator. Uh, let I have to. I can't quite see. Okay, sure. Um. Hello, Andrew Wilkins from Stiftung Mercator in Germany. Um, I was w just wondering why does the, the committee only have representatives from, from the US and the UK when INET has sort of a global vision? Wouldn't it make sense to include some people from Europe and from emerging markets already in the beginning? Well, we had to start somewhere. and. Um, We've got, a, we've got a panel of consultants who come from as many places in the world as we, um, as we um, could um, find contacts with. And uh, they've been feeding in the whole process. But I think uh, it's, if, 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 someone, if someone wants to do something in any of these countries um, and, and um, uh, under the INET umbrella, they're very welcome to set up task forces of their own. What we do at the moment is keep everyone informed through INET of what we're doing, and this has been one of the occasions to sort of uh, also do that. And, and we, we can't uh, bring in 190 countries into this process simultaneously um, under, under, under one particular um, uh, one particular task force. That's the answer to, to your question. Um, if uh, we, you know, there, are, I think there are one or two German consultants who have been feeding stuff in. Um, maybe I would just add add a bit. You know that that at least my view of what we need to do next is exactly that. Okay, that we started there, and for sort of accidental historical reasons, the Queen's question, blah, 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 okay. But now, now we can maybe be more deliberate and, 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 and more inclusive, and, and absolutely, I'm, I, absolutely. There's someone at the back, there's someone over there. Uh, Giovanni Dosi, um, I've got enormous sympathy, of course, to, to this attempt of reforming the curriculum. I think uh, that uh, behind that, uh, uh, inevitably, there, there should be an attempt uh, of uh, refounding the theory um, and refounding, refounding the general interpretation. I mean, uh, you mentioned Samuelson, and uh, it is true. Behind uh, Samuelson introductory text, uh, there are Samuelson foundations uh, that are sort of the, uh, the, the, the difficult uh, foundational issues are dealt there, and then uh, there is uh, the, the introduction that comes after. I think that uh, parallel to this effort of reforming uh, uh, the teaching, uh, an urgent task uh, is to basically take upside down the current economic theory ranging from uh, how people behave all the way to institutional organization works and markets work, uh, all the way to uh, agro aggregate dynamics. Otherwise, I don't think that will be successful. Oh. 
Um, yes, OK, I guess I keep forgetting. I'm supposed to call on people. Yes, could yeah. we, a microphone, please? It's coming. It's right there. Yeah. Hi, Doug Carmichael, Stanford. Uh, two questions. One is, uh, did you reconsider possibly resurrecting the ideas of political economy as a frame? And the second is, it seems to me that we want to have a frame that would be congenial to network theory and emergence uh, phenomena, that kind of new thinking and chaos and, and so on. And uh, so those are my two questions, whether you considered those. Can I answer the political yes, economy? Yes. We did, um, I, I, I like political economy, but um, there's a lot of resistance to it. Um, I think um, for some people it smacks of Marxism. And um, anything that smacks of Marxism is obviously very suspect. Um, but I, I think it's a very good phrase that expresses, if, if, if correctly interpreted, expresses exactly what um, we're trying to do. I should say there's another meaning of political economy which is equally disturbing um, to people who want to reform, you know, some of the people who want to reform the curriculum. Um, but um, uh, if, 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 it could be, if it could be done without... Um, offense, it would be a very good restatement of what economics originally saw itself as doing, because it was called political economy um, without any of these um, uh, other, other connotations until the end of the 19th century. And then, as it became more technical, um, the political economy bit was dropped and it just became economics. That was the UK development. I'm sure it was similar in America. I, I will add to that, it just again, about the deliberations of the committee itself, it, we sort of started, I think, with the idea that we needed more economic history and more history of economic thought. I think more people sort of thought that. Um, and that's in line with INET's, we have these task forces, right? Um, but as we thought about the curriculum, it seemed like just adding a few courses like that was not going to do much, okay? So we started to think about how to infuse the curriculum with, with you know, what, what is it about those courses that was important? Um, and how could we infuse the curriculum with that? Perhaps that gets to your point about, about, about political economy. But it was, it was also about different modes of thinking, different modes of, of uh, different kinds of information, um, you know, not just things that could be quantified, uh, that, sort of, that, sort of, that sort of thing. Um, let me call on Maria Cristina. Yeah. So we'll take turns. I'll call and then yeah. you call. That's how we'll do it without, without a moderator. Just a quick point. Uh, yeah. I am, as an historian of economic thought, yeah. I'm, in the, oh, I'm Cristina Marcuzzo from the University of Rome, La Sapienza. Um, I'm, of course, delighted that history of economic thought has become you know, one of the focus of INET and of your proposal. The point is that history of economic thought is not unproblematic. There is not one way of doing history of economic thought. Uh, and uh, I figure out that perhaps a little bit more discussion should be there how a course in history of economic thought should be taught in 2010, 2012. And um, I think the traditional way in which the, the subject was taught is one of the reasons why perhaps it was perceived as boring and, uh, you know, some archaeology and so on. So there are exciting way of doing this of economic thought and I'm sure that the panel should take this into, into consideration. You know, just saying we have to have a course in history of economic thought and, you know, Aristotle and up to then when it ends, when the history of economic thought ends, Keynes or mm -hmm. Lucas. Uh, so it's not unproblematic. It's not something that one say, let's have a history of economic thought, you've solved the problem. Mm -hmm. You have just start thinking where the problem is. Okay. Agreed, Thank agreed. You. Agreed, yeah. Um, Jay, did you, ha have I got the right person? No, in the front row, yes, yep, yep. Uh, it's the Bodhi. Uh, Sorry, I couldn't see. It's quite all right. Uh, I'd like to return for a second to the issue of uh, economists as dentists and usefulness in that sense, in the sense of practically useful. We are uh, witnessing all over the world, especially in the United States, 
a campaign for financial literacy. In fact, the month of April in the United States is being uh, regarded by the highest political uh, level, the Department of the President himself, Department of Education. It is a national priority. And yet, I see nothing about that in this new curriculum. I think we need to make a connection, or you do, at not INET, between what the public sees as of critical importance, personal financial decision making, decisions about career, decisions about buying or renting a car, a house. These are all very real economic decisions, and in fact, the decision about whether to buy a house and how to finance it is what triggered this crisis. Mm -hmm. And yet we're not talking at all about how do we educate the broad population to make those kinds of decisions. Mm -hmm. Isn't that what economics is about? Well, partly. I mean, would any of our, our, our team like to comment on that? I mean, it's something we have talked about. Um, John, John Kay, Kay, John Kay. Who's the UK. I think we saw it as partly as part of what we described as mapping the economic landscape. And when we define broadly, and I think this is right, as the objective or one central objective as being not, I think, just to read the op-ed stuff in the Financial Times, though I hope people would, <laughs> but actually enabling people to read the Financial Times as a whole, because it actually seems to me if that summarizes the current gap between the expectations that employers particularly would have of students who graduate with economics degrees and the reality of what students with economic degrees can actually do, it's their capacity to master that these particular tasks that actually makes that difference. Yes, that, that is right. I mean, we talked, this, this which, which maybe you didn't get that. Robert said it sort of in passing, but I think the committee as a whole, basically everyone endorsed this notion that being able to somehow engage with material at the level of, of the FT was a good sort of idea to try to, and that means bringing in knowledge of finance and accounting, putting accounting in the first, you know, there was basically broad agreement in our committee about that, okay, which is why our very short introduction was mm -hmm. sort of accounting and things like that. Uh, there, w there was a, a lot of agreement about, about that. And if, I, if we didn't bring that out, you know, I, I, I apologize. Well, that's what I meant. Yeah. yeah, I know you're speaking more about personal finance, okay, and that, uh, I, I, hear, I hear that, uh, and, uh, and, and maybe we had a little macroeconomic bias in our, in our thinking. As well. um, Duncan, do you have a, I see your hand's been up for a while. Yeah, I'll, I'll get to Axel afterwards. Yeah. Um, well, there's, uh, there's a little bit of an elephant in the bedroom feeling because uh, when you teach undergraduate economics, um, the issue of mathematics and statistics um, always looms very large. And in your presentation, um, there's a couple of um, boxes marked tools and um, items like that. But I think the, um, the treatment of mathematics and statistics um, deserves the same kind of thoughtful um, uh, mulling over and uh, revision, uh, particularly in terms of the spirit in which it's taught along the lines of the Menand book, for example, that um, you want to give students some confidence without their fetishizing um, uh, quantitative uh, techniques. And we might want to think about um, ways to um, do that. I think that also might require some substantive changes in the way um, mathema certain techniques are taught. For example, I think, personally, I think it would be a really good idea to uh, try to give up equal, uh, equilibrium in favor of explicit dynamics as a way of trying to think about modeling. Um, I personally think, I know I'm, this is not a popular view, that statistics is much, much more easily grasped from a Bayesian point of view 
than um, in, in classical ways of teaching it. But those are just ideas that ought to be thrown into the hopper and ground up by your, by your discussions. But uh, I, I don't see how a uh, successful economics curriculum can avoid this issue of at least giving students a confidence that allows them to defend themselves against a certain level of mystification and uh, um, intimidation that's associated with math and statistics. Um, well, maybe, S Steve, former our committee, maybe you want to, we, we did talk about this, but it doesn't show up in our presentations, but, and, and, and Barbara and Kevin maybe have something to say too, yeah. Uh, Steve Ziliak. Yeah. It's, is it on? There it is. Yeah. Steve Ziliak, uh, task force member, U.S. and Roosevelt University. Duncan, that's a great question. We did talk about it, and I think the um, anthology for intermediate level students that uh, we're proposing, Reasoning Like an Economist, is a kind of book that will address these kinds of issues and teach the skills that, that students need um, to have empirical confidence. The first chapter, for example, or the first section might be on introducing data. Um, you know, introducing sure, data one is one of the most yeah. important yeah. things yeah. that a research scientist yeah. can do. You know? I mean, if we didn't have Madison's long sweep of, of, of statistics on economic growth, what would we know about the $3 day? You know, somebody would el else would have to do it, you see? Mm -hmm. If Francis Amasa Walker had not been so um, imaginative when he worked for the uh, Census Bureau, uh, we would not have, well, yeah. that would have had to be invented too. But who, are, yeah. you know, you need a I skill set to do that. Steve, so the anthology, but uh, there's also, we, another thing we also talked about, uh, we called uh, Excel econometrics. You know, so, so instead of starting with learning about probability theory or something, starting with basic, you know, spreadsheet, on mapping data, manipulating it, uh, getting a sense of it, uh, maybe using some of these new, new technologies. That's what I was trying to show with that, with that beautiful recession graph there. Um, so we're, we're not unaware, unaware of this. I, I think maybe the better thing to say is we're not very advanced. Um, let's just take one more, and then let's go to the bar here. So, yeah. Axel, you want to? Axel yeah. uh, Axel yeah. uh, somewhat retired. Um, I would like to uh, uh, throw a little cold water on the way I hear the history of economic thought being referred to here. Um, I think that uh, those courses died for, uh, not perhaps for a good reason, but for a reason. And the reason had to do with the way that uh, macroeconomics and microeconomics was being taught. Uh, they are at different levels of simplification. They tend to be taught as sort of the, the current state of the art, the, the, what, we, what we have learned uh, today. And the current state of the art is taught as being correct the, and true until further notice. <clears throat> and uh, that way of teaching uh, uh, theory uh, automatically in the minds of uh, students and of most instructors turns the history of economic thought to sort of stories about the wrong things people used to think. Mm -hmm. And uh, therefore, it's not really important. Um, I never taught a course in the history of economic thought, although I've written a fair amount of stuff that belongs there. Uh, but I used to have a lot of history of economic thought in the theory courses that I taught. And, uh, that used to be a distinguished tradition. If you think of people like uh, Jacob Weiner, uh, he, could, he couldn't do, do theory without the history of thought. Um, Lionel Robbins uh, taught uh, economic theory from a historical evolution, sort of an evolution of the way of, of uh, theory standpoint. And I think that's the way it has to be done if it's going to inform people as economists. Uh, I used to tell students to think of the history of economics as a decision tree. 
and you go back in that decision tree and you have to understand why the, the profession uh, was persuaded to go this way rather than that way. And if you teach it that way, the students also learn something about, uh, about theorizing as a creative uh, pursuit, uh, where uh, what persuades people to go one way or another uh, uh, becomes a discussion of the tools that economists use in making uh, these choices. And I think that's the way it has to be done if the history of the subject is going to be a live part of uh, uh, people's education. Um, could we just have Hajun, who's on our task force, just he seems to want to respond to that, so. <laughs> Right, I'm Hajun Chang, uh, University of Cambridge. Um, well, actually, the, I mean, we haven't fully developed it, but uh, we want to do something even more than that. We want to integrate the teaching of theory, not only just uh, with uh, history of economic thought, but also economic history and contemporary policy problems. So if you are teaching moral hazard, you could teach them about, uh, say, the South Sea bubble, which uh, that, uh, led to banning of uh, limited liability banking. Yeah? And then uh, you could uh, bring in the Asian crisis and that, uh, how Adam Smith was against limited liability and Karl Marx was in favor of it and so on. So actually, you, you have to bring all those things together. You know, I mean, I, I mean, that, that do not do any research in the that, uh, history of economic thought, but when I said boring, I mean, you know, the history of economic thought uh, course I learned as an undergraduate uh, student in the 1980s uh, back in South Korea was like, yeah, I mean, uh, you start with you know, the Greeks and, you know, I mean, by the time uh, you uh, reach, I don't know, McCulloch, uh, you run out of time and you, know, <laughs> you never learn anything interesting. So, I mean, th that is uh, something that we are very conscious of uh, avoiding. And ideally, I don't know how far it is possible uh, given people's uh, specialization, but Ideally, we want to bring all these things together, the theory, economic history, history, economic theory, and the contemporary policy problems. I think uh, we ought to thank you. Up, um, so. if you, and I, I repeat, we're very interested in hearing uh, further pushing, and talk to me, talk to Robert, talk to any of the task force members who are all here. So we have a, we'll spread out and, and take your feedback. Uh, thank you. Thank you.